Um, okay, so today's topic is linguistic relativity or the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Has anyone ever heard of this hypothesis or uh, this idea of linguistic relativity? Um, Mohammed. Oh, no, it's just. Um, so a few of you have. Um, if anyone wants to say what it is right now, feel free, or I'm just going to work through what it is. Um, first off, let's just talk about uh, what is relativity? What does it mean for something to be relative? That things are subjugated to like a certain society, community, or culture. Yeah, so basically relativity in general means that it's not the same for everyone, or more accurately, things are not Things are different in terms of truth or falsity, depending on where you are. So um, this is a much easier example to give if we are, if we were in person and I could walk into the actual classroom, but uh, you're just going to have to bear with me despite this. So an example of something that's relative is right and left. So looking at the screen right now, which of these two markers is to the right? Blue. Blue. So for you all, the blue marker is to the right. Now imagine if you were in my position, which marker is to the right for me? Red. Yeah, red. So like, this is what it looks like from my perspective. And this is what it looked like from your perspective. Now, is there a fact of the matter? Who is more correct? Who is correct? Is the red really to the right or is the blue really to the right? Well, that's a nonsense question. The correct answer is the right answer is relative to where you're standing. So for something to be relative, is it true or false? Not universally, not for everybody, but rather it's true or false relative to some other thing. Um, does anyone have any other examples of things that are relative? There's lots of them out there. So right now we've got right, left. Movement um, and time. So the time. So time is relative in a few different senses. One is the Einsteinian sense, which breaks my head. But a more straightforward one is just what time, like what the clock, what correct time it is, is different depending on which time zone you're in. So, for instance, in New York City, it's 10:52 a.m. But it's only true in the, nor the Eastern day non-daylight savings time zone. If we were in London, the correct time would be different. So that's a good one. Movement is also relative. Um, so, you know, how fast is something moving next to you? Well, it depends on how fast you're moving. So if you're standing here and a bus goes by at 60 miles per hour, then the bus is moving past you at 60 miles an hour. If, however, you were yourself moving at 40 miles an hour, then the difference between you, the bus relative to you, is only moving 20 miles an hour. Real, uh, morality is another one. You might think that what counts as a moral, um, what is moral is going to change depending on what culture you're in. Um, so for instance, there are, in a culture in which human sacrifice was a common religious practice, you might say that relative to that culture, it's not wrong to kill anyone. Um, beauty is another one. Different cultures have different definitions of beauty. Some places it's being a one weight. Other places it's a different weight. Some places it's pale skin. Other places it's darker skin. Um, intelligence is another one. What count? What does it take to count as intelligent? Well, it depends on what context you're talking about. Like your dog is might be a very intelligent dog. It's relative to being a dog. It is very intelligent, but it's not intelligent relative to a human being. Um, or you might be, whether you count as intelligent depends on which area we're interested in. I have no artistic skill, so I lack artistic intelligence. Yeah, cultural practice is another good one. Yes, yeah, so for instance, um, what counts as polite is different in different cultures. Like if you, or relative to who you're with. So for instance, if we were to meet for the first time in class and I were to greet everybody by giving them a big hug, that would in some sense be bad. That would be a mistake. I'd be somehow crossing the boundary. But if I were to just to shake my father's hand, that would also be really weird. Um, Muhammad says language. That's another really good one. In terms of what language somebody speaks is going to be relative to where they're from, what, uh, what the national language of a country is, depends on where you are. So that's all we mean by language. Or I mean, sorry, what we mean by relativity. Relativity 
is something is true or false only relative to something else. I can't find my marker or I need my uh, eraser. So uh, I'm going with my hand. This could get very messy. Uh, I apologize. So if that's what the uh, what relativity is, the other terms that you can contrast it with are completely subjective or completely objective. So something is completely subjective if the only thing that makes it true is your opinion on it. So for instance, is it a good movie or a bad movie? Well, that's relative to you as a person. That is totally subjective and it can change moment to moment. On the flip side, there are objective facts which are the same for everyone universally across the board. Um, by including, um, huh, would I include nihilism in this? I guess by nihilism here, do we mean that everything is equally meaningless or that there is nothing? Yeah, so the way I actually think of, I actually think nihilism is a sort of objectivism because there is an objective fact of the matter. Everything is equally pointless. Like if everything by definition is equally pointless, there's a fact of the matter that everything is pointless. Um, in the same way that if everything is equally bad, everything is also the best thing in the world just by definition. Um, but objectivity is something that is, the tr is true no matter where you are, what you're doing, et cetera. So an example would be, um, what is taller? So if I were standing next to someone, like imagine I'm standing next to an NBA player, there's an objective fact of the matter, no matter what planet you're on, um, no matter what place you're from, et cetera, one person's taller than another person. Um, that's just a fact of the matter. That's what we mean by objective. Um, if morality is relative, it doesn't exist. Uh, so yeah, I guess another thing going down the nihilism path, another thing you could say is if something is, I mean, this is a moral relativity question, um, which is a separate issue, but there is definitely a question of, uh, well, actually, I don't wanna go down the moral relativity uh, nihilism hole because that'll take us really down the, down the rabbit hole. Um, but I think that, where nihilism falls, this is basically just like a, a rough chopping up of things. The main thing I wanted to, to the main um, contrast that I want to draw is between objective and relative. And for something to be objective is the same for everyone, everywhere, all time. Relative changes depending on something else. So um, the law is relative to what jurisdiction you're in, right or left is relative to what position you're in, etc. So um, that's the relativity part of linguistic relativity. Now, what is the linguistic part? So those of you who have heard of the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis or linguistic relativity, does anyone um, want to take a stab at what it means, to, it, linguistic relativity means in this context? If I understand the theory correctly, uh, Worf essentially theorized that as someone's language completely like morphs how they view reality, like the metaphysics, their um, ontology, like all these things are influenced by their language. Yeah, that's exactly the idea. The idea is that according to Worf, so the, it's called the Sapir Worf hypothesis because the name it's most associated with was a guy named Benjamin Lee Worf. And his teacher was a linguist named Ed, uh, Edward Sapir. So these were two guys in the early 20th century. But Worf's main idea was that you might think that as you go around in the world, there's an objective fact of what exists and what's real and what's true and what's false. And he wants to say, no, that is not the case. Rather, what is true, what is false, is determined by what language you speak. Because what language you speak has this way of controlling the way you experience the world and the language you, you speak imposes itself upon the world and changes your very experience of what is real. So um, let me just, his common terms are something, uh, this was one way that Worf repeatedly said it. He says that, to speak a certain language, you by definition have a, um, a distinctive 
conceptual theme that um, dictates your what's the word um, that uh, let's erase this that what's the organizes experience and gives you a distinctive world view. So the key words here are this notion of a distinctive conceptual scheme that organizes your experience and gives you a distinctive worldview. So the idea is that you might walk around in the world and think like, oh, there's a fact of the matter. As I walk by six squirrels, there's a fact. It is a true statement that there are six things there out in the world. Those six things are there. According to Worf, however, if you spoke a different language, then it's possible that you would not it wouldn't be the case that you experienced six individual things. Instead, perhaps you experienced um, six parts of a greater universal whole, which is a very different worldview. Or perhaps you just experienced some of something. There's some squirrel there. And to say that to speak a language other than um, the language you speak is to have a fundamentally different experience of reality. And so this is a very stark, extreme view. And to be clear, it is a very interesting view. It's one that has a lot of appeal in um, certain disciplines. And I think there is something to be said for it. And there are some uh, very good reasons to at least take this idea seriously. Um, and interesting, I mean, these, this is not a settled view. There are still many people who largely accept the Sapir Warp hypothesis. And there are many others uh, in linguistics who say it's just fundamentally flawed. But do you understand the general view of like what it means? Like, and it's a very extreme view in a lot of ways. We're gonna go through some examples here of things that Sapir brings up um, and which people have brought up since him to illustrate this point. But uh, that's just the background of the view. So Warfianism and Neo-Warfianism um, it's tough to draw the line between them. Most people today do not want to accept Worf's extreme views. And neo-Worfianism, which is, we'll be talking about it a little more, is this view, it's a much more uh, tempered version. Instead of saying that these things greatly dictate our worldview, they say instead things like which language we speak influences our worldview to a smaller degree. So I think it comes down to whether you want to say Warfianism and Neo-Warfianism are the two versions of the same view or two different theories along a single theme. I don't think there's a fact of the matter about what the correct way of chopping it up is, but that's the background. All right, so that's the background of what Warfianism is. Now, just one clarifying point of Warfianism. It is not the uh, clearly true view that uh, different languages have different words and that the words of a language respond to the cultural uh, needs of that language. So what do I mean by this? Um, there are many languages which have different levels of formality in their words. So I don't know how many of you take uh, French or how many of you have taken another language in which there are multiple words for you. So in English, whether it's somebody really fancy, it's still you. If it's your best friend, it's still you say you. In French, it's if it's somebody who's above you in social status, like a professor, you'd say vu. In if you're talking to a, a peer or someone below you, it's tu, tu. There are other languages where it's a lot fancier. So in Thai, I think there are seven different levels of formality, um, depending on who you're speaking to. I know Japanese has at least four. So that is something in which like clearly there are dialogue or there are dialect differences or differences in terms of vocabulary. Also, another one that's obvious is like English speakers today have a word for like iPod. We've got the word iPod. If you went into like 
if you were to get in a time machine and go back to ancient Rome, they're not going to have a word for iPod for the very, well, why not? Why is there no Latin word for iPod? It didn't exist. Yeah, there were no iPods. They didn't need a word for iPod because there were no iPods. So this is also a different view than Sapir. Sapir's not just saying this very common everyday sort of thing that our words shift depending on our uh, culture or that different cultures have different words. He's making a much stronger claim, namely that the language we speak dictates our entire way of perceiving reality and what we are willing to say is true and false. And more importantly, what actually counts as true or false changes depending on what language you speak. Um, so is everyone on board with this general view of things about what we mean here? Now I want to actually give me one second. I need to grab something to wipe this board off. So that's the background of what this is. So now let's talk about what some of the things, because Worf doesn't just stop with, wouldn't this be a cool idea? He instead points to actual examples of linguistic differences and then says, if you look at these and you think about them, they are clear evidence that our language dictates what we say is true or false. So just to take some um, nice, neat examples. So uh, I can never remember how to spell this language. I think it's this. I think it's Atsagewi versus English. So in English, how would you say, well, I'm going to draw something. This is an animal that goes rivet, rivet. actually not a bad rivet rivet. So what type of animal is this? A frog. It's a frog. And now if we were to describe this frog moving, like imagine it does this, what would we say in English? It jumped. We'd say something like the frog hops. So we've got this thing the frog, and what is it doing? It's hopping or jumping. And so the key here is what does this right here pick out, the hopping? What well, picks out a way of moving, a manner of going. In Atsagewi, it's a very different um, way of expressing it. If I'm not going to actually put it in the, Atsagewi is a Native American language. It is now dead, but when Worf was writing and other people were writing, I think it only died out within like the past 20 years. And by that, I mean, the last person who was fluent in this language has since died. But the way that they didn't have a word like hops or jumps, which dictates the manner of moving. Instead, the verb captures the form of the thing doing the moving. So it would be actually translate to something like the frog, squishy blob moved jumpingly. So what do I mean by this? Well, in Atsugewi, the word you use is not picking out the verb, is not picking out the manner in which the frog moves. It's instead signifying what type of thing is doing the moving. So for instance, um, if I were just saying it moved in English, I would say the frog jumps. If I were to then describe like a snot falling out of a nose, a snot is a very different thing and snot doesn't jump. It instead like, I don't know, drips or whatever a snot does. But in Atsugewi, frogs and snots get the same verb. So the frog squishy blob move is the verb you'd use is to say that the thing doing the moving is squishy blob shaped. It's not saying the manner in which it moved. That's not contained in the verb. If you wanna bring that up, you, you would have to put it in like an adverb form at the end. So the frog squishy blob moved in a jumping way. 
Well, in English, if we wanted to say the same thing, we'd say the squishy frog hopped or the squishy frog moved. So do you see how in, in Atsugewi or another language, you literally cannot put it in this way of jumping as the verb itself. So what Sapir says or Worf says about these sorts of things is this is a very different way of thinking about reality. If you ask an English speaker what sort of activities or what sort of actions are there, they're going to describe them in terms of the manner in which the action per is performed. So a frog hops, a bunny hops, they perform the exact same type of activity. That is part of what it is according to war, to be a speaker of English, to think Englishly. And the reason you'd say that bunnies and frogs partake in the same activity, and though even the sense in which you think about it, is conditioned by the fact that you're using the same word here, this hop word. Well, an Atsugewi speaker is not going to put frogs and bunnies in the same category. Rather, they're going to put anything that's squishy and blob shaped into a category. So frogs and snots and pieces of mud. Those are things that move in the same way because for an Atsugewi speaker, that is the way in which the language groups reality. And so there, according to Worf, there is no fact of the matter as to whether frogs and bunnies engage in the same activity or whether snots and frogs engage in the same activity. It totally depends on what language you speak. So does everyone understand in this sort of sense, like how extreme of a view this is? Um, Another example that people go with is um, there's a language of um, Aust like the Australian, uh, like the Western Australian desert, I think. It's definitely Australian. Goo goo yimmy fear. Gugu Yimi Fear is a language which doesn't have the words in front of or behind or left or right. So for us, we say the marker, this marker is to the left or right of this one. In Gugu Yimi Fear, instead, every single direction is done on entirely a north, south, east, west basis. So if I were to hold these in front of you, I would say the red marker, I don't actually know what direction I'm facing, but imagine this is to the east. If I'm facing you, I'd say the markers to the east. If I were looking this way, it's still the markers to the east. If I were to move it farther away, it's still, I still talk in terms of cardinal directions. So Worf is going to say that somebody who thinks in this way has a fundamentally different way of thinking about how they get around in the world. Instead of thinking about getting around in the world in terms of taking lefts and rights, they think in terms of going north or south. They think about if you're asking like your direct like organizing your house, these people aren't thinking in terms of, uh, I'm gonna put the TV to the left of the couch. Or I'm gonna put the, the TV in front of the couch. I'm instead gonna think in terms of, I'm gonna put the TV to the north of the couch. I'm gonna put the couch to the west of the coffee table. So, um, and to be clear, Worf is saying that it's, they think this different way because the language they speak is different. Because Gugu Yimmy Fear doesn't have words for left or right, this is something that shows that a Gugu Yimmy Fear speaker, because they don't have that, they have to think in terms of north, south, east, and west. Um, a last example is a uh, Piraha. Piraha is a language of the Amazon that was studied heavily in the, uh, I want to say the 80s and then into the 90s. And then Piraha, in Piraha, there are no number words. There are, there, there's the only two things that might be dictated as a number word is there's a word that you can use for a single thing, which translates roughly to that right there. And then there's another word for a couple or maybe an optional couple more. So if you were to ask a Piraha woman who had five children, how many children do you have? She couldn't answer the question because she doesn't have a number word. She literally cannot, if you, if you ask them to count, they do not, that is not something that they do. And the argument here is the reason they cannot count is they lack the language for it. And therefore these aren't practices they engage in. So the idea is that Piraha 
lacks these language words, and that constitutes a fundamentally different way of approaching reality. For a pure aha speaker, there's no fact of the matter. You couldn't say that there's like, for us, it's an objective fact. There are five squirrels out on the patio right now. For a pure aha speaker, that's not an objective truth they can say. That is not something which is true for them. So these are the extreme sort of Worfian views. So does everyone understand or kind of, it's an, again, it's a very strong extreme view and you can understand the appeal to it because it's a really, really cool idea. Um, another famous example is that Hopi, which is a Native American language, doesn't have words for time and therefore they don't think about things in terms of past, present, and future. Instead, it's thought of as a cosmic like cycle balance. Um, that's, that's another one. Another one is that Eskimos are better at identifying different types of snow because uh, Eskimo languages have many words for snow. So do these, does this general picture make, like, I'm not saying do you think it's right, do you think it's wrong, but is everyone following what linguistic relativity is and how extreme of a view it is? And these sorts of examples that Worf gives are designed, and not all of these come from Worf. Some of these are more recent. Worf died in, I think, 1941. But Worfianism is still alive and in different degrees, as Eddie brought up. Some of it is neo-Worfianism, which we'll be talking about in a second. But Worfianism in general is this view that literally you have a different experience of reality and what is true for you changes depending on what language you speak. Um, so that's the background thus far about Worfianism. Um, now, I now want to talk about this neo-Worfian views and specifically the experiments which have been given in the past few years, which seem to support something along the lines of Sapir, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. And these neo-Worfians get into a lab and they have found, they have found some really fascinating ways in which what language you speak has an objective influence on your behavior. Um, so one of these was the uh, article I gave you, the, the Boroditsky Russian blue squares uh, experiment. And so basically just to put in context, what I'm gonna talk about now are Worf came up with these grand statements and pointed to linguistic examples that seem to constitute a difference in worldview. But he was not somebody who went into a lab and actually tested how the language we speak influences our behaviors. More recent Neo-Worfians have been going, and these, these experiments, I think were in the early 2000s mainly, they went into a lab and took speakers of uh, different languages and then said like, let's put them in tests and show how their behaviors work. So, um, Kaywin asks, is a reason why German has so many great philosophers? So one hypothesis for why Germany has, and I, I think I've read this places, is why does Germany have so many great philosophers? Well, the reason is their language is so complicated and allows words to be combined together such that it encourages people to think in a philosophical way. So for instance, in German, in English, you can make compound words up to two parts. You can take like, you know, rain and bow and make a rainbow. Um, but you can't just combine as many as you want. But German, you're able to stick basically as many words together as you want. So if you ever want to, uh, like German is a fascinating language in this way. And there's a lot of really funny, entertaining words to an English speaker. Like instead of saying, um, well, I don't have any off the top of my head and I'm not a fluent German speaker, but this is a, a, a superior, a Morphian would say that one of the reasons why Germans are so, there are so many famous German philosophers is literally the German language has led to philosophical thought. Uh, so that was Worf's way of doing it, is you kind of look at language differences, you see how people act differently, you analyze them and you see that, well, if you were to ask these people, are these two the same thing? Is what the frog's doing and the bunny doing the same thing? An English speaker is gonna say yes. An Atsugewi speaker is not going to say yes. And Worf said, this is a sign of a different experience of reality. Now, the Neo-Worfians, uh, Schadenfreude is a great one. Schadenfreude, I, it's a German word for that feeling of satisfaction you get watching other people that you don't like suffer. Um, it's a brilliant word. English doesn't have an equivalent, so we often just have to use Schadenfreude. And my guess is that is a compound word. 
um, of Schaden and Freude. But um, yeah, German is super fun to, to find their compound words. Some of them are like 47 words long. And if I, if I didn't value your time more, um, kindergarten is another good one. Yep. Um, the, I think garden, I can never remember what the garden part is, but the kinder part is children. Uh, but you can, you could combine kindergarten with another word and it can just get on and on. And um, anyway, so neo-Warfian experiments. Does anyone want to try to explain the, um, the Boroditsky blue box experiment or should I just go ahead and go for it? All right, I'll just, so here's the experiment. Oh, Eddie, do you want to give it a shot? Okay, all right, so here's, you get into a lab. So the background you need is first off, the two types of groups in the lab were Russian speakers and English speakers. Um, in English, we have two, we have one word for blue. If some, I mean, if you go into a Crayola box, you can put other words on top of it. So you could have like Robin's egg blue and cobalt blue, et cetera. But in English, generally, we have one basic word blue. If something is a Robin's egg, it's blue. A navy blue is still blue. In Russian, however, there are two distinct words, one for light blue and one for darker shades of blue. And so the way this experiment works is an English speaker would go into a lab and here's what you'd be presented with. You would get three boxes. One of the boxes would be one shade of blue. And then you'd have two more boxes down here. One of them would be the exact same shade of blue as the one before. And then the other one would be a slightly different shade of blue. So I'll use blue and green together. It would actually be the two colors in the experiment would be much more similar, but it would basically look like this. And if you were the person in the lab, you would have your finger on two buttons and you would be asked as quickly as possible to press left or right, depending on which color matched with which one. So in English speaker, where we have only one word for blue, what they found is if these two colors were like, if this was light blue and this was the matching one was light blue and this was light blue and this one was dark blue. So actually let, let me, all right, let's put this, see if I can describe this experiment clearly. Light blue one, light blue two, light blue one, light blue one, light blue one, dark blue. So if you are an English speaker and you are asked which of these two matches. And you can imagine this is one shade of light blue matched down here. And this is a different shade of light blue. Well, over here, this is a shade of light blue and this is a shade of dark blue. If you ask an English speaker, like which of these match, they will be equally fast in both cases. Doesn't really matter what the slight differences are. Interestingly though, if you ask a Russian speaker to do this experiment, Russian speakers are consistently faster at identifying this case, the one in which they have two different words. So if you give them two light blues and ask them to separate it from a different light blue, it's slightly slower than if you ask them to differentiate, like which of these two is more similar? Well, if this other one is falls in their dark blue range, the one that they have a different name for, it's slightly faster. This is suggesting that the fact that they have two words for blue literally does make them behave slightly quicker in identifying this difference. This is a in a lab behavioral difference that derives from the fact that Russian has two words for blue. Um, to go with some other examples, which are uh, maybe a little easier to describe. So in English, if we have a night in which we, and by night, I mean N-I-G-H-T, not K-N-I-G-H-T. Um, so a night in which this was before COVID, you went out and you partied until 5 a.m. What would you say? What, how would you describe this night in 
what word would you use to describe that this night went on for a considerable amount of time? So tired is one thing you could say, but if I were to say this was a blank night and I wanted to say that it went wild night would be another one, but what is the uh, amount word we'd use? Long, it is a long night. Now, um, any Spanish speakers? Okay, how would you say this in Spanish? If you wanted to say that the night went on for a very long time, what word would you put in here? Now, mucho, exactly, mucho. And what does mucho technically translate as? It technically, if you wanna be literal about it, it's much or a lot. So if you were to translate it in Spanish, it's actually a lot of night. So in a sense, like you much or large or a lot of, it's not a matter of distance. So one way of like talking about this is that English and languages, it's kind of random which way they go. So English, uh, French, and I think Indonesian and a lot of others go this long way. It's a long night. Well, Greek, Italian, Spanish, and a bunch of others do this a lot of night. So. Um, in a certain sense, this is like a meaningless difference. Nobody, until you get in a like linguistics contest, context and you ask people, like, how do you say these things? Most people don't realize there's this difference. But in truth, one of these, the long one is talking about time as if it's a distance. So it's like a long line, a long night. The Spanish way of doing it is it's in terms of like a volume of night. So you can think of it rather as like a big box or big thing filling up. So on the one hand, this isn't that complex of a difference, but interestingly, um, this guy named Casa Santo did an experiment. And basically what he did was he asked English speakers and Spanish speakers to look at a line that was expanding and ask when it would hit a certain uh, boundary and also ask these English and Spanish speakers, here's a box that's going to slowly fill up. You can imagine just like filling up. And it's, and it's like on a computer screen. So you're either watching a line expand across a, a distance or you're watching a box fill up with color. And what they found is that English speakers are more accurate when asked to judge when the line is going to hit and Spanish speakers and speakers of languages that talk about a mucho tiempo or a, um, are better at guessing when is this volume space gonna fill up. So this is a case in which, again, we don't think of this as a major difference, but if you actually look at how people behave, there is a detectable difference in a lab between this case of something filling up and a line going down. So again, a Warfian, or in this case, the Neo-Warfians are going to say, this is a sign that what language you speak is affecting your experience of life. It is changing your behaviors simply on the basis of what language you speak. Um, does this make sense? Like, it's like, a again, it's an extreme view. And I think that uh, we're going to come back in the second half of class about what are some issues with this methodology and what does it really show? But the experiments themselves are really clever and interesting. And so if you speak English, you are better at identifying when a line is gonna hit an end. The last experiment I wanna talk about is this one in which um, there's a lot of languages like this where in English, yeah, Ray says it sounds suspicious and I, am, I wanna talk about the suspiciousness of it. I mean, this is true. This is in a lab, they have done these tests now. If you wanted to dive into, I am not an experimental psychologist uh, in which I am not in a position to 100% analyze the accuracy of these experiments. Like I do not know the statistics, but they have shown statistically significant differences in terms of how accurate people are in judging these lies. Now, and we're gonna talk about in a little bit what counts as statistically significant is gonna be like kind of up in the air. Um, so we're gonna come back to that in a second, but these. These experiments have been performed and people generally expect that they do show a very, like they do show a subtle difference in how people behave. Now, the last one is um, 
there are many languages that are like this. In English, if we want to, so let's talk count verse mass nouns. Does anyone know what the difference between a count noun and a mass noun is in English? A count noun is something that you uh, can individually count. So like one marker, two dogs. You just put a number word in front of a thing. A mass noun is something that doesn't come in uh, neatly divided parts. It's instead a big clump of something. So for instance, if I wanted to talk about two dogs in the corner, I could say there are two dogs. And if I wanted to talk about two, I couldn't say there are two dusts in the corner. I'd have to say something like there are two piles of dust or um, there are two bags of flour. I can't speak about or two clumps of dirt. I can't say two dirts. That's not good English. There are languages though in which um, technically speaking, every single noun gets treated grammatically as a mass noun. Um, so for instance, the example from um, that I'm most familiar with is in Japanese. I'm pretty sure though, um, many Chinese languages, those of you who are fluent in Chinese will know the answer to this better than I do, but I'm pretty sure in Chinese, it's the same sort of thing where technically speaking, if you look at the grammar, um, Eddie, let, give me a second to finish this and then I'm going to answer this question. So, um, So in Japanese, the way you say two dogs is not, there's a word here. You have, you can't just say two uh, dogs. You have to put a word here that is like this counting word or it's a category word, which tells you the sort of thing that a dog is. And it's just, it's not grammatical if you don't, yeah, a unit word. Uh, thank you, Ray. So this is, uh, this is a word. So in, in Japanese, the technical translation is you put a word here that translates to something like that gets applied to small animals. So it would be two small animals of dog would be like a literal translation. No one would actually translate it that way, but you have to put a certain word here that applies only to small animals. Um, and then there's another one for things that are like long and slender. And there's another one for things that are in groups and stuff like that. Um, so why is this relevant? Why am I bringing this up? Well, there was this experiment done in which speakers of a language like this, in which you have to put these unit words of two blanks of dog, where each unit word is depending on what the noun is, which uh, language it is, whether somebody talks in this way or whether someone has count nouns seems to affect how people group things. So they asked English speakers and they asked uh, Japanese speakers. Uh, K1 also says Chinese has no verb tense. Yeah, that is another classic. So to zoom out for a second, actually, let me finish this experiment and then I'm going to come to the no verb tense because I think Chinese is a case, is like it, a language that Warfianism has a very difficult time wrapping its head around. Uh, so first, let us finish with this unit word stuff. So. They've done these experiments, and I, the experimenters who did this one were named Imai and Gentner. And what they did is they gave Japanese speakers and English speakers three objects and asked which two went together. So in one version of the experiment, they gave people a, uh, a wooden lemon juicer. So you know what I mean by lemon juicer? It's like that little handily thing where you squeeze it and the juice comes out of the lemon. So they gave a wooden one, wooden juicer, a porcelain, I have no idea how to spell porcelain, I think it's that, juicer. And by porcelain, I mean just like a little piece of clay or a piece of, um, I mean, it, it's just like a hardened clay sort of thing, porcelain juicer, and then broken shards of porcelain. So just like pieces of clay. And they asked English speakers and Japanese speakers of these three items, which go together. And what they found was English speakers consistently put the two juicers together. The fact that they were of different materials didn't really matter. For the Japanese speakers though, they more often group things together based on the material. 
they did another version of this in which they gave English speakers and um, Japanese speakers one, they gave them a big C shaped uh, blob of Nivea, which I think is like a hand lotion type thing. They gave them a few little drops of Nivea and they gave them a big C shaped thing of this hair gel stuff called Dippity Do. So they gave them these three things. Again, the Japanese speakers consistently put the Nivea together as these are the two things that get grouped together, the things that are of the same substance, while the English speakers consistently put these two together because they were in the same shape. So the experiments were designed to show that the natural way we go about categorizing things is influenced by the language we speak. If you speak a language in which you need these unit words or you need to talk about uh, things aren't just like dogs aren't just dogs, they're small animalnesses of dog, or they are, you put this word, which is the grammatical one that goes for small animals with dogness, and that's how you do it. So this was another experiment which was designed to show that we think how our behaviors are, are determined by the language we speak. The language we speak is literally, in some sense, changing what it is to live in the world, changing our experience, changing how we behave, and it's literally the language that's doing it. All right, let's pause here because that is a natural pausing point. This is what the, so just to review what I'm talking about, this is what linguistic relativity was. So Pierre's more extreme version of people of different languages conceptualize the world very differently. And then the newer neo-Warfian experiments that are designed to give some teeth or some experimental evidence that something along this line is true. Um, do people understand the, the general view? All right, I wanna answer it. If War takes this relative view of how people's uh, realities are shaped by their own language, would someone such as Ayn Rand be the antithesis to War? I think Ayn Rand is tough. And I, and I don't know exactly how these two would engage, but my temptation would be that Rand would be unhappy with the degree to which the community language is determining things in a Warfian view. Um, so my guess is that she would not accept the general view that we, if there's an objective fact of the matter it would be, or if there's a fact of the matter, it's gonna be grounded in the individual as opposed to the group. So she would probably, um, oppose it on that sort of ground. I'm not sure if that's fully responsive because my RAND knowledge is, I haven't read RAND in some years, but that's the background. Oh, all right. So everyone on board with what we're, where we are right now. All right, let's talk about the issues. So as I said, people generally accept the neo-Warfian experiments, but generally these days, the extreme version of Warfianism. So yes, William asked, is it possible to say that this influences some of your experience or some of your reality without influencing all of it. And I, I'm tempted to say, oh, the background's a little blurred. Is it better? All right, awesome, thank you. Um, so there is something to say, and one thing you might wanna say about uh, Worf is going back to the initial statement. He says it's a different world view. And one of the issues with Worf is he was not a like a, a hardcore linguist. He wasn't even an academic. He was actually a fire marshal in his daily job. Like he literally just was somebody who decided on the side of like stopping fires in Boston, he was going to take classes at Harvard and then did some writing. So this word worldview, what constitutes a different worldview is incredibly vague. And so one thing you can say uh, is that like, all right, we've looked at these neo-Warfian experiments and these show something interesting, but do they really constitute a different worldview? So that's one thing you can say about it. So I wanna just go through some of the issue. Well, we've now got Warfianism up here. Do, does anyone have any things that immediately pop into their mind of like either these experiments don't show what they claim to show or Worf's examples are flawed or any sort of issues that come into mind when you're presented with this hypothesis. Because I've, a lot of you had the, well, those of you who I could see had the confused face that I had when I first heard about Worfianism. 
So are there any any sorts of things that pop? One thing I find interesting when it comes to address, English writers describe the specific location first. Yeah, so, um, so here's one of, Ray asked a great question. English speakers say something like Queens, New York City, instead of the other way around, if you say the country and then the city. Do we really think in this way? And it would seem like what Worf would have to say is this is a fundamental different way of thinking. And I honestly don't know what this says about my thought. Like, I don't know whether I think specific and then general, or I think general and then specific. And so one issue that I think comes up, well, does anyone want to say any issue they have um, with I Warfianism? Think right, more. I think this is a great question, which is just like, I really don't know how I think about, do I think of Queens before I think of New York State, or do I think of New York State and then think of Queens? Honestly, in my own mind, I think I think of Brooklyn first, or Queens first, or Manhattan first, but that's just because I think my father grew up in the Bronx and categorizes anything farther north than the Bronx as upstate New York. So therefore, um, that might just be the way I'm thinking, where I don't even think of New York City and New York State as the same place. Uh, when you read a letter, um, do you recognize the address in the same order? No, I think when I'm looking at a letter, I do start with like the general, I look to like the state and then the city and then everything else. So I do, I definitely, yeah. When I'm looking at a letter, okay. So um, that's just like the little conversation that was happening over here with Ray is actually really useful for illustrating. Um, and I think since both Ray and Cynthia are bringing up very, or Ray's point is one that I think is an issue and Cynthia and William are bringing up a different point. And I think one of the key differences is that um, sorry, my mind's a little fuzzy today. This whole uh, COVID thing's getting to me. Um, all right, so first issue I want to talk about is the point that Cynthia and William just brought up, which is, can I give an example of how these sorts of things would impact your life on a grander scale? And the short answer is uh, no. And that's one of the major issues, or at least with the neo-Warfian experiments, it's very hard to point to a way where like, all right, they've shown in a lab, like, let's go back to that blue squares thing. The amount of, does anyone, uh, did anyone read in the article what the actual difference in time was between the Russian speakers who were able to do it much quicker and the English speakers who did it much slower? It was the difference between the two groups was on average 124 milliseconds. That is one tenth of a second. That is about as fast as you can click a, uh, a stopwatch. Back when we use actual stopwatch, you go tch, tch. That is a real difference, but it is so small that it does start to feel like the Neo-Warfian examples do not show a fundamental difference in worldview. They show a very subtle difference in individuals' uh, behaviors depending on culture. Same thing with the, um, with the uh, grouping things together in terms of material versus function. I mean, in a certain sense, like, yes, I might be more tended to, like, if I'm grouping things, I might group all the porcelain, I might be less likely to group all the porcelain things together in my kitchen and group all the juicers together, imagining I had more juicers because I'm an English speaker. But again, that hardly seems like a fundamental difference in reality. And when we actually look at the examples which are supposed to show these fundamental differences, um, it starts to feel like these don't necessarily show some major difference in what it is to be human, but some very small, subtle, interesting differences, but not something that proves the stronger Warfian point of this is a fundamental difference in reality. Um, um, So yeah, so here's the thing is, um, Eddie brings up this point. So let's just go with the Piraha who don't have counting words and therefore can't do math. They don't have the number words for math, so they don't do math. And in Worf's language, this would show that these people um, 
relative to that community, math does not exist in a certain sense. Like their sense of reality does not include math. And that is an extremely uh, complex or like an extremely strong statement. So for the Piraha, from their worldview, math is not something that exists because they don't have the language for math. And if you pause here and think about it, you might be like, wait, that seems like a very extreme view. Um, because, so here's, here are the sorts of things that come up is, do these people trade? And Ray's asking the right question, which is one of the, the short answer is no, they do not trade. And the reason why is because they are such an isolated group in the Amazon that they never come into contact really with outside groups. It was like an anthropologist happened to live amongst them, but there was no sort of trading in that sort of thing. But if you, the issue with this is, um, according to Worth, the reason that these people don't do math is because the language doesn't have number words. But if you take a step back, there might be another reason that they don't do math. And it's got nothing to do with, it's not that the language is making it the case that they don't do math. Another explanation is that if you live in a tiny group in the rainforest, you have no need to do math and therefore your language doesn't develop the words. So yeah, Ray says, it seems like it's the other way around where we invent the, the language comes, um, the, the cultural practices come about and then we get the words or the language afterwards. So another one with the Eskimo case where people talk about like one of the classic kind of caricatured examples was according to a Worfian hypothesis, the reason that uh, Eskimos are so good about at telling apart snow is they have so many words for it. But it seems like a simpler explanation would be something like Eskimos live in a really snowy place. And because they're there, they spend so much time looking at snow that they've come up with many different ways to tell it apart. And once they have those different ways, they give them different names. So the idea is that according to Warp, language changes, changes the worldview. But it seems like what might actually be going on in a lot of these cases is rather that cultural needs shape the language. So it's not that language is changing the world or what we think is true, worldview or culture, but rather the other way that culture is changing the language. So to take another example of this, um, the Gugu Yimi fear example I gave of north, south, east, west, instead of left, right, in front of, behind. Anyone have any ideas for why a group would always talk in terms of north, south, east, and west? If they were traveling a lot and needed to be more geographically aware of where they were. So that's one. It's just like in their environment, these people um, were traveling more. Um, and the idea was that, uh, so actually what it was is I think they traveled, but more importantly, uh, they live on a totally flat desert in the middle of Western Australia. Now, has anyone ever been in a desert? Also, Cynthia and uh, Eddie's earlier question, I will respond to these as soon as I'm done this. Um, so in a desert, there's, I, so I wanna just tell you both that I'm going to go back up and read this, but I wanna just finish this thought before I go back and read the comments. But um, in a desert, there's not really that much around, like a totally flat desert. If you're out in New York City, you can say the building to the right or left, there's lots of landmarks around. If you're out in a flat desert, there's nothing out there really to reference. I mean, out West you get mountains and things, but out in like the, the totally flat desert of Western Australia, there's nothing you can really reference of where something is relative to something else other than where the sun is. That's literally the only thing you have to go off of. So it seems like the reason that the Gugu Yimi Fair language only has North, South, East, and West, and they orient themselves in that way is because there are no other options out in the wilderness, when you don't have things you can point to is to the left of, to the right of, to the front of, to behind. You can't say this mountain is to the left of this mountain. All you can say is like to the north because that bit of blank terrain looks the exact same as this bit over here. So the idea is that the Gugu Yimi fear, the reason that they do things in terms of this north, south, east, and west is not that their language has the words north, south, east, and west, but rather that um, 
in that environment, they have to learn to do it that way. And then the language followed suit. So they started, they never developed a left and right word because they could never organize things in left and right. And one piece of evidence for this is if you take a fluent Google Yimifir speaker and take them out of the Australian desert and put them into a different society, they very, I mean, I don't know how long it takes, but they lose their ability to do things in terms of north, south, east, and west even though they remain fluent in the language, which is suggesting that the North, South, East and West orientation is much more to do with the environment. And it's the environment and the culture dictating the language, not the other way around. All right, um, let me scroll up and look at these. Eddie says, I think the thing that's struggling most is to say that one's language changes the reality of someone's concept of the world, maybe couldn't we say, oh no, we already did that one. It would be similar to say that during the medieval period, physics did not exist because there was no language for them to base science also, off of. However, atoms and the laws of physics still existed. It was just not within our world of language. So I think this is another issue that you can point to with Worf. Worf is going to have to say that while maybe there was a physical world out there, the fact of the matter of the sort of um, existence we have, like it was for medieval people who lacked the language, He's going to say that, yes, as a matter of fact, atoms and the like did not exist for them in an ex like we have to give it, it's a crazy extreme view that you have to go with. Um, and what he would say is the reason this seems so reasonable to us is that we now live in this world in which we speak of atoms and whatever. But if we wait, if we go like 100 years down the line, you know, the way we I talked about atoms in my chemistry class in high school was just like fundamentally different from my understanding of them in like a theoretical physics sense. So he's gonna say that like, yes, while uh, we think we're talking about the truth when we say atoms and when we talk about gravity, really this is just one of another sort of, um, he's gonna go with an extreme sort of, yes, even the physics, like what exists in the world in a scientific sense is gonna change based on what language you speak. And so S Cynthia says, the good theory, if only focus on the individual, maybe the language you use to ourselves impact the life we live, but again, everyone perceives the world differently. Um, sorry, I just accidentally scooted over this. Uh, not only because of language, because of factors like race, wealth, health, gender, sexual orientation, national. So language has the power to shape some patterns of thought. Uh, example, if you're a pessimist, you will, think that life will, okay. So what Cynthia is raising here is I think I'm related in with this issue, which is there are many individual differences in terms of how we experience the world. But what she is pointing to, and if it's a long comment, so if anyone wants to read it in the chat, it's there. But it's basically that Worf is saying it's the language. But what Cynthia is raising here is it seems like it's a lot better explanation to point to many of the other cultural factors. Like if I want to say that the reason I'm sexist is because I use sexist language, it seems more straightforward to just say that like, no, I'm a sexist person. And that is the fact that changes my worldview. It's not the fact that I use the sexist language. It's rather the fact that I'm a sexist is what causes me to use the sexist language. So instead of it being the language which is shaping me. It's rather like we do have personal differences. Worf though is saying it's the language that drives this. And I think a good thing to say is a lot of the cases he points to are ones in which it looks like, no, 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 it's not the language driving the culture, but it might be the culture driving the language or the cultural needs and cultural differences shifting the, the world. Or like what looks like language shifting the worldview is actually our individual differences affecting um, our behaviors. And language is not in any way having to do with it. All right, let me see where we are on this. Okay. Um, give me one second. And here's a, so is everyone, uh, so are people following along with where, where we are right now? Are we doing okay? All right. As, again, this is a fascinating hypothesis, which, um, as Eddie just pointed out, has some really extreme consequences and a, like 
According to Worf, yes, there isn't like the biology or the physics we follow is just part of our cultural worldview. And maybe our cultural worldview, like we are certain that our physics and our understanding of reality is right. But if you go forward a hundred years, maybe they'll be looking back on us as cultural idiots who, you know, you know, everyone, um, you know, we used to think the earth was flat. Now we laugh backwards at those people. Well, maybe they're in a hundred years going to look back and be like, these people thought that uh, most of reality was atoms, but now we know it's strings. Ha ha ha. Aren't they such idiots? So Worf was trying to say that we should be more, we should be less certain that we are right and actually think of our way of conceiving of reality in a much more open sort of way. A, we're just one of the many different um, one of the many different ways you can approach reality. And for a Hopi speaker, it literally is true that time doesn't exist and there is no past or present. Um, and what, so if you take that extreme view, now a good response to that is something along the lines of, well, um, actually, let me answer Ray's question. I'm going to pop back. All right, races, it can be a circle. Environment shapes language, language shapes perception, perception changes action, action creates environment, any scientific realism. So it seems, Ray, that uh, there are some reasons to think that it's not a perfect circle of one influencing the other, influencing back. But I think there is a sense in which, and what these uh, neo warfian experiments show is that there can be a small amount of influence of the language on how we think. And maybe that does determine our behaviors in subtle ways. But I think that what a lot of you are pointing to is this doesn't really seem like a fundamental difference in worldview. It seems like um, while there are these little differences, the, the extremes you have to go to to accept uh, Worfianism, this idea that our phys there's no fact of the matter as to what our physical worldview is, the thing that Eddie was just talking about, is a, does seem too extreme or too far in a lot of ways. All right, let me pause one second because my brain is, you know, jumping all over the place as I'm sure I'm having trouble following me right now. So I'm sure you all are too. So um, let me summarize where we are. Then what I'm going to do is say, uh, so first off, let's summarize. We have the superior warp hypothesis, which is this idea that the language we speak literally changes our worldview, what is true and false, and how we experience reality. Um, there were these examples in which Worf points to things like these differences between Native American languages, how they symbolize, or how they uh, show, how they carve up the world in terms of what actions there are, whether bunnies and frogs are doing the same thing, or whether frogs and snots move in the same way. And then we have these neo-Worfian experiments which show that behaviorally the language you speak has very subtle differences on how you respond to certain situations. The question is, is this hypothesis right about reality? Is there really no fact of the matter of what's right and wrong and rather our language dictates the truth? And what people have started to point to is a lot of the things that look like support for the superior warp hypothesis are actually better explained as instances of culture influencing the language. So things like the Gugu Yimi Fair language is a response to the fact that they're in a flat desert. The Piraha not counting is rather a response to the fact that there's no need to count when you live with 15 people in the jungle. Um, another worry you might have about um, linguistic relativity is it goes too far. And this was Eddie's point of, it's demanding you to say that the worldview you have is no different, uh, or is just a different way of approaching reality. And your physics is no better than their physics. And just because it's true for you is a sign that your language is dictating what's real and what's not real. So for instance, for us, we the reason we think time flows in one direction is we speak a language in which it does. But what Hopi shows us is that if you have a language that doesn't have tense words in the same way, your conception of reality is different to such a degree that we are just one of many. And Kaywin says a little like anthropology. And yes, in anthropology, you're not supposed to say one culture is better than another. You're just supposed to say they're different. And so Worf wants to say that 
even built into our worldview because our language shapes our reality and our languages are different. We do live in just different realities, but all are equally good. Um, all right. So if you need to go right now, uh, you are free to go. I'm gonna, just going to keep lecturing so that I can get this all in one video. If you want to stick around, you're welcome to. If you don't want to stick around, you are, again, go and the YouTube video will be up. I'm not judging anyone. I, if I'm alone in front of this camera, that's totally fine. Um, I'm going to give it a minute. So there's two more issues that I want to talk about with, um, so yeah, Eddie says a big issue with linguistic relativism, it relies on this major assumption that metaphysics is very malleable subjective thing. And one of, um, and this is actually just to go a bit more philosophy, one of the background assumptions that Worf was working with was this sort, if you've not taken a philosophy class and this is boring to you, uh, just feel free to blank out for a second. But the basic idea, he was like a sense data theorist, by which I mean that he thought that our experience just came to us in like a blooming blop, blopping um, just madness. So there was no order. Like even the only things that enter our head were like color splotches. And then through experience, we learned to organize those things. And so if you think that our experience is in like a very empiricistic, Humean sort of blooming, buzzing confusion, and the only way we get order to our experience is by imposing things on it, then the idea that your language might be imposing structure on a reality can seem a lot more reasonable. But if you're somebody who believes that certain aspects of our experience, human beings experience as an organism, are tied in with our implicit perceptual abilities or our concepts we're born with, then you're going to say that these are the sorts of things which are dictating the language as opposed to the other way around. If you didn't follow that, I'm sorry, but um, it's just like a background about Worf's way of approaching reality. He thought, he really did think that because the only thing that we have as a grounding level for our um, theorizing about reality, our sense data, or things entering our eyes that have no implicit structure to them, it's okay to say that it's our language that's imposing the structure, and there are no metaphysical underlying facts. Now, two more issues with linguistic relativity that I want to talk about are, one, um, how do you explain survival and two is he reading into language too much so this how do you explain survival thing so according just to take the um, classic case that Worf goes with he claimed that the Hopi language had no way of expressing past, present, or future. It was just like everything was the now, everything was experienced in this way. And just to use this example, think about how hard it would be to get around in a world in which you couldn't express past, present, or future. Um, so you couldn't like say, you, you wanted to say like yesterday we were hunting in this, like if you're a hunter-gatherer society, um, I actually think of hoping we're farmers, but you can imagine in something where you're like, yesterday there was a mountain lion in the area and you need to avoid it. Well, to bring up the fact that there was this mountain lion, it seems that you're going to have to make reference to time. It seems like even if you want to say that like we have a fundamentally different metaphysical worldview, like Worf wanted to say, it seems like to get like basic facts about human beings have to assume a level of time. Like even animals seem to have some basic idea of one thing happening before another. If we go back to those dogs in the, um, in the Pavlov experiment, the ring the bell and then salivate assumes a certain level of time flowing in one direction. Like it's like built into the dog's brain. So it seems like, as Eddie was saying, 
Worf seems to fly in the face of the fact that there are certain metaphysical facts that are the same for everyone. And if we were to get around in the world at any level, you need to take those certain facts as a given. Um, let's see what other things do I have on this? Uh, another thing is a lot of the examples Worf points to, there's he's claiming this is a fundamental metaphysical difference but it's very hard to I, actually see differences in behaviors. So there are plenty of um, languages in which the color words are very, very different from our own. Some group green and blue is one color. Others have multiple shade, like multiple words for different blacknesses, be they shiny or matte black. And it seems like if Worf was right and this co color constituted a worldview, we'd expect to see fundamental differences. Like if you had like a blue and a green, if the word was the same, then, and this is what somehow changed your perception of the colors, then you wouldn't ever expect to see these people with color, like trying to have different colored shirts of blue against a green background, et cetera, because they wouldn't have a language for it. So the language would change what they see, the colors they see. But if you actually look, um, like, yes, there are these very subtle differences in a lab with the two shades of blue with the one shade of blue. However, if you actually look at um, people who have very different color words, it's not like people who, um, Korean has one word for green and blue, um, but it's not like Korean speakers cannot tell the difference between a Granny Smith apple and the sky. Like they know it's a different color in the same way that like there are other languages that carve up blue differently than we do, like Russian. It's not like I can't tell that this marker and a navy blue flag are different colors. Like there's some sense in which um, Worf is assuming too much power for the language, which ties to the last thing I wanna say, which is, is he reading too much into the language? And if you actually look at a lot of the examples he points to of showing this different worldview, a lot of them are just weird linguistic quirks where if you actually look at them and think about how you think of these things, you realize that uh, it seems like he's approaching these in the sort of way that only a linguist would, and he's reading into the language more than's actually there. So to take an example of what I mean by this, let's just go with an example of take a poop. According to Worf, you can learn about the nature of how someone thinks about something based on what the grammar of the language is. So if you look at English from a Worfian standpoint, he's going to say that our understanding of what pooping is like is there's something it's like to take one of them. And in the same way that the Atsugewi approach to animals is in terms of their shape moving, our understanding of poop is as something that is taken. But if you actually pause and think about it, nobody thinks that when you're pooping, there's any taking going on. It's just a turn of phrase. Same thing with running late. Like nobody thinks that when you're running late, there's actually a very active sort of experience going with it. It just seems like sometimes our language has these weird quirks that don't actually change our linguistic experience of reality but are rather just something which the grammar dictates we have to do for who knows what reason. So when you actually look at a lot of the examples, like when you bring up things um, like the uh, unit words, or you bring up things like um, the differences in how like mucho tiempo versus a long time, if you actually bring these up, people very often are like, huh, I didn't ever realize that was a difference. So another thing is that it seems like what Worf is doing is imposing on these languages his own linguist sort of view and drawing the wrong conclusions from it. It seems what like what's happening here is we all know that pooping does not mean taking anything. It's just we somehow learned this phrase. So in the same way, the examples Worf is pointing to don't show something extreme. It just shows that language is weird and the reality we have which is shared amongst each other ends up being um we impose weird language structures but at the end of the day the experience underlying it it's not like pooping is fundamentally different whether you talk about taking or giving or just pooping pooping is pooping 
And so in the same way, Worf is trying to draw distinctions where there aren't any on the basis of these linguistic sort of interpretations. Now, the last thing I want to say about Worf is that um, to give him a, uh, the guy was very well-intentioned. So yeah, it's, it's almost like Cynthia says, were, were they trying to use language as a way to control human behavior? So actually it was, um, it was a much more noble cause than this. So when Worf was writing in the early 20th century, he was writing at a time in which people thought of native peoples outside of the civilized world as less than human. So at this time, you read things about people, like this was the time in which you still referred to Native Americans as the savages and things like this. And Worf was somebody who came along and wanted to say, like, he had incredible respect for Native peoples and wanted to try to argue, like, hey, no, these people are not worse than us. They're just different. And so what he tried to do was argue that if our way of perceiving reality is shaped by our language and their way is shaped by their language, we're equal, we're just different. And so this was his way of attempting to go in this noble direction. But what this one thing this does is kind of show like, oh, there's a sociological explanation for Worf's hypothesis. Therefore, if this is a sociological explanation, it doesn't necessarily show these sorts of like, you don't want to give a sociological explanation for a scientific fact. You rather want to give a scientific explanation. So it seems like with Worf, a lot of what he was saying was motivated not from like a quest for the truth, but rather for a quest to do something good for the world or respect a group of people who hadn't been respected. But that's not a good grounding for science. Um, all right, so sorry that got a little, like we said last week, everyone's brain's a little fried and that definitely includes mine. So I can tell you with certainty that my head was not as focused as it usually was. So if this was at all more confusing than usual, I'm sorry. But just to summarize again, we've got this idea that uh, language shapes our thought and the way we experience reality. And there are these experiments which suggest it does and to certain degrees. And also I do think there's an argument to be made that our language is so important in our everyday interactions that if our language is dictating us to do things like say different things get grouped differently, if I put all the juicers together, but keep the porcelain things separate. There is a sense in which my interaction with the world is different from somebody who groups all the porcelain things together. However, there is this question of, is that constituting a different worldview? And is it right to draw these extreme conclusions like Worf does? And most linguists today don't agree with the extreme Worfian views. They're gonna point to examples like take a poop in which like the taking is doing no linguistic or semantic work as evidence that we can't read a semantics off of a language, that what makes something true or false is sometimes, or what the meaning of a word is, isn't always clear on the surface. Also, they're gonna to point to things like science does seem to work regardless of what your worldview is. So this was Eddie's point of, at the end of the day, atoms either exist or they don't exist. And it doesn't seem like whether our language is one or another is the right way to go about assessing whether atoms are real or not, or what atoms are like. All right, thank you for those of you who stuck around. Are there any questions at this point? Are we doing okay? Questions, comments, concerns? All right, I'm gonna go now and write up the paper prompts and get them posted by tonight. And so you can all look at them and the deadlines and all will be posted on there. So thank you all for bearing with me. Um, the, so Kaywin, I, yeah, the dates and everything will be on there. Um, and I'll include in an email the big to do. But basically, the earliest the paper could be due for you will be the last day of class. That's going to be the short answer. All right, I will see you all next week. I will resend out that uh, reading about um, conspiracy theories. All right, goodbye, everyone. Professor, I have a question. Oh yes. 